Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Modern Insights from Microscopy Images workshop at I2K 2022. I hope everyone is enjoying the virtual conference. Today, we're going to be talking about web-based methodologies. My name is Matt McCormick. I will be the instructor for today's workshop. And we're going to go through a number of interactive sessions in Jupyter Notebooks. If you'd like to follow along and you're highly encouraged to follow along and participate and go through the exercises, there is a con environment and I will put a link in the chat here to the repository where you can find this. We're gonna start with an introduction that is not going to be too interactive, but while that's happening, you can go ahead and get started installing the environment. So install the con environment from this repository and you will get the index here. And as an overview of the content for today's workshop, first we're going to kind of provide some context on what are the modern web-based technologies that are available to us if we wanna do web-based image processing and analysis. And then we'll go into what are the technologies and some examples specifically for visualization. After that, we're going to have an introduction to WebAssembly, which is processing in a web environment. And then we'll talk about data storage for the web, distributed data storage. And then finally, how to use all those components together with distributed data image processing in the cloud, locally and in the cloud. And at the end, Pranjal, who's a, another instructor, instructor here, will go through a end-to-end -end pipeline that involves segmentation and registration and analysis and processing and show how all these different components can be composed together to solve a practical problem. So first we'll start off with an introduction. And if you don't have the Khan environment installed, you can run this notebook in Colab. The link is here. So this tutorial, out, this tutorial intends to provide a background on what are the modern web-based image analysis methods and why are they relevant for large images and reproducibility? And how does open source software fit into this ecosystem? So at a high level, what do we mean by web-based image analysis and visualization? This means the user interface is the web browser usually, and we're communicating if we're using traditional methods through the HTTPS protocol. So there's, there's many older protocols like FTP uh, that are around, but the highways of current web-based methods are HTTP. We'll kind of briefly discuss, and we've been building a bridge to the next generation of communication and computing, which is Web3, and that that communicates over other methods than, than HTTP. And in this case, computation can happen in the cloud or more generally in a non-local location, be a cluster, a traditional compute cl cluster at a university or at a national lab. And so what we are building on, especially for these client-side methods are modern browsers. And if you're familiar with browsers or, or developing for browsers, you may have heard this term evergreen. And evergreen refers to the set of browsers that have um, been developed recently that are always updating their versions. So they'll automatically update. You don't have to install a new version. They have auto updating processes. 
and they're always evolving and keeping up with the new web standards. And the new web standards are relevant to us because they allow us to do high performance computing, visualization, 3D visualization in, in modern web browsers. And what is the ecosystem like today for web browsers? Chrome dominates the, the modern web browsers and the foundation of Chrome is used uh, now, including by Microsoft's Edge browser. Firefox is also another evergreen browser that keeps up to modern standards. Uh, the other major browser out there is Apple Safari. Um, Safari can be lagging behind in standards, but it is actively developed and evolving. In practical use, Internet Explorer kind of has finally died and is no longer targeted, and it, but it lacks a lot of the modern web standards. So those are the browsers, the main browsers that you get concerned about. Um, a variation to be aware of are browsers that are built for desktop operating systems and mobile operating systems. They're often built on the same core technologies, but they have different functionality variable available. And when you're developing some functionality that's going to run a web browser, how do you figure out what versions of the browsers, what browsers, what operating systems are available in your client or user base. You can use this caniuse.com website. And with this website, you can type in, in a search box, a feature, WebAssembly, and that will give you a high level overview of globally based on the distribution of browsers that are installed and being used, what percent or per percentage of users have that functionality in their system. And then it also gives you a very nice breakdown of the different browsers and the different mobile versions of them and their versions. And green is where they do have a, that functionality available and red is where it's not available. Then it also gives some other tips on, on how to make it available. So you want to program for the web, program for web browsers. Uh, what does that mean? How can you do that? I know many of us are in scientific computing and we like Java, we like Python, uh, but if you want to learn how to program for the web, you want to learn how to program in JavaScript. Uh, even though it might not be a favorite language of some folks or the first language they go to, it is the only client-side language that is universally supported in these evergreen browsers. And in recent years, it's become a very nice language actually to program with and against. Other programming languages often compile down to this or WebAssembly, which we'll talk about in, in a few minutes. JavaScript is the language of the web. It runs in browsers. It also runs server-side. So you can develop with it server-side. The most popular server-side execution engine is called Node.js. You install that. It also comes with a package manager called NPM. You might hear the, the term ECMAScript. That's just another word for JavaScript and the standard of the language. And if you want to find out more, the best resources is MDM, the Mozilla Developer Network Documentation. Modern JavaScript has mostly been replaced in the last year. If you look for web projects, they're not written directly in JavaScript, but in a superset of JavaScript that's called TypeScript, which is basically JavaScript with types. If you remember with types added to Python, it's a very similar thing in JavaScript. It's happened in recent years. If you're not programming in JavaScript, you can compile down into a binary format that's now supported by all evergreen browsers. This is called WebAssembly, and we'll have a tutorial to de dedicated to WebAssembly 
in a minute, but this runs in the browser without being transmitted as a script. So the text of the code, it's a binary format. It also runs inside other languages and outside the browser, as we'll talk about in a bit. Outside the browser, it's a variation that's developed in the last few years called WASI, the WebAssembly system interface that extends WebAssembly. The other technologies, what are the other technologies to be aware of for visualization? WebGL is the extension of OpenGL, but the API that's available in web browsers. And that's being replaced, um, not quite available across all browsers yet, but very close to availability by WebGPU. And that's kind of a modern graphics API, but it also supports kernel computing, GP, GPU comp computing. So it's exciting in that way. Other technologies to be aware of are web workers, which allow you to do parallelism, multi-threading in the browser, and service workers that allow you to cache data for offline computing. Some notable projects to be aware of in the scientific image ecosystem, ITK WASM is a project for building C++ code to WebAssembly. PyScript allows you to program in Python, H, uh, Python HTML with Python, but running WebAssembly and JavaScript. Jupyter Lite is client-side running execution of Jupyter kernels for Python that are running WebAssembly or JavaScript. And ImageJ.js is ImageJ, the Java code ported to WebAssembly. And those are client-side technologies. You can pair them with your favorite server-side languages, Python or Java or Rust or Julia, JavaScript, C++. And you pair that with web-based storage methods, which we'll discuss in a subsequent tutorial, and cloud computing, which is discussed in another tutorial. The way we pair it is through communication. And the traditional way is through REST, so HTTP URIs, calls to these standard methods, get, post, put. There are more performant ways to talk to different systems, and those are web sockets and web transport are in other ways. And emerging through this ecosystem are very modern ways of communicating, which include the interplanetary file system, IPFS, um, and libptp, so peer-to-peer -peer networks that communicate through novel protocols that they're the up and coming way to communicate over the web. So these, that's an overview of the different ways to, the different technologies in the ecosystem. What are some of the challenges that you have when you want to work with some large, large imaging data sets? The data set needs to be transferred over the network. That's kind of the main challenge. And so we need a way to approach remote storage naturally, naturally and provide data that is piece, piecemeal as we need it. Also, compression is very important. On top of this, we want to use open standards so that our computation and our results are reproducible and they can be extended and built upon for open science. Uh, so what happens when you use some of these open standards? So here's an example, if you run this cell, this is a little article, a version of an article of a publication that was publishing a filtering method, a smoothing method. And the neat thing about this example, this web page, is that it's running in my browser and I can click on a figure and it will reproduce the figure, run the code that was described in the article and reproduce the results in the figure. You can download the results or even upload custom data the very compelling part of this 
web-based technology. You can run it with different parameters. Is that this was developed and published eight years ago, and it still works and it's still functional, and people can still learn from it and and build on it with no maintenance required and um, no changes to the code. That's a high level overview. And here's a list of some really interesting projects to take home and, and study after you get home, after the tutorial here. One that I'd, I'd like to point out that you may not be aware of is Imjoy, which is an active pro project in the e ecosystem that brings together many of the different technologies that we are going to study today. There's not an exclusive tutorial here today, but I highly encourage you to, to check it out. So we're going to finish with a little exercise tutorial to get you started with programming for the web. The most important thing to learn about is how to debug and develop for the web. And that means getting used to the JavaScript tools, development tools in your web browser. So you can get to these tools by going to the menu and then more tools and developer tools. It's usually a shortcut like control shift I. And these tools are available across all your different browsers, Chrome, Firefox, Safari. Click that on your browser and it will open up by default a developer console. So it's like your terminal developer console. You can see print statements that were added to JavaScript code. This is a lot of print statements from the code that I executed on the page. And you can run code in JavaScript in, in IPython. And we'll see that output in the console. So why doesn't everyone take two minutes to start to inspect your development developer tools in the browser. This includes the other tabs and the other features that are available, performance profiling and recording and other tools. And we'll take two minutes and then um, proceed to the next tutorial. If anyone has any questions about getting started with the Jupyter Notebooks, you can either Unmute yourself or type them in the chat. Yes, yeah, so Rebecca is asking this percent percent JavaScript in the cell. Does that say run? How does it? What does that mean? That means in the Python kernel, usually a cell will run Python code on the Python kernel by default, and that's in a special escape hatch to allow you to run things in JavaScript. Yeah, so you're correct there, Rebecca, and. The other trick is that you can actually run that in the interactive interpreter in the web browser, whether you have Jupyter running or not in any web page. So we can go to the, the console here, console tab, it says console on the top. And then we can say console.log, which is the equivalent to a print statement. Hello, I2K and it will print that out. And Thomas is asking, do most browsers still work in 32-bit? Uh, most browsers are supporting 64, our native 64-bit applications, which is exciting. There is, maybe you're referring to the fact that JavaScript, the language supported in the browsers, it only supported 32-bit 
integers for some time. So in JavaScript, there is one number type, and this actually resolves down to a, or there's two number types now, but there used to be one number type. And um, I can say num equals five, four, and that is a number type. Here it says number. And that's internally being stored as a, as a float, if you're familiar with it, a float. And so that's kind of limited into the range of values. Recently, there is a new number type because you couldn't get 64-bit integer support from a float. Uh, it's called big int. So you call big int, and this is supported by all browsers now. Um, and that is supporting 64-bit integers. Good question. Now it's, it's fairly well supported. And the other nice thing about using WebAssembly, so you have your, your two options are JavaScript and WebAssembly in the browser, is WebAssembly is a, uh, it has a 32-bit runtime, but it does support 64-bit integers by default in the language. They're working on 64-bit uh, runtimes for WebAssembly too. Okay, great. So let's go on to the next tutorial, which is visualization. And so this is a, a notebook. And in this notebook, this tutorial, we're going to learn about the different technologies that are available in the browser for visualization, including just regular HTML images, canvases from interactive, WebGL for 3D visualization, WebAssembly, and WebGPU. Briefly discuss the trade-offs of server-side and client-side rendering, and then become familiar with some of the open source tools that are available to us. Uh, if you're running in Colab, Colab as a runtime has some limitations. So you see some little differences. You make sure to run this first cell. So what are, let's take a little survey of the different browser rendering technologies. So we have the classic IMG HTML element. The nice thing about the IMG element is that it's universally available and it supports many kind of the standard file formats that are used for photographic imaging, not necessarily scientific imaging, 2D formats, PNGs, et cetera. And you can inline support for base 64 encoded images. So you can in one page also encode the image data. The limitations are that it's not well suit suited for dynamic content and it doesn't support uh, multiple pixel components, anisotropic spacing, 3D images. If you have an image that is 16-bit uh, or float pixel type, it's not going to be supported unless you do some manual transformations. So this is an example image. Moving beyond the basic IMG HTML element, we have the canvas element, which is another HTML element and it's very widely supported. It's well suited for dynamic content, it has a low level API, and there's also many JavaScript libraries for high level manipulation. Limitations are, it focuses on 2D graphics and the performance is limited relative to, to WebGL or WebGPU, which are GPU accelerated uh, 3D um, backends. So here's an example using the IPy Canvas Jupyter uh, widget interface to the Canvas element. So it's creating a Canvas and calling some of the basic foundational uh, functions that you would call in JavaScript with Python on the Canvas to create a nice winky face. Next is WebGL and WebGL is hardware accelerated 2D and 3D graphics uh, that draws on a, on a Canvas context. It has widespread support across the different browsers. It's well suited for dynamic content, has great performance, a low level API, JavaScript libraries available for high level manipulation like V2KJS or 3GS, and it supports 3D visualization. The limitations are that there are resource limitations based on the texture size, the number of textures. So you have to be careful. You use a library 
uh, like ITK WASM, if you want to deal with some very large imaging data to avoid running into limitations of GPU memory or performance. There are kind of two standards that are supported. WebGL1 is very widely supported. WebGL2 was very well supported across Chrome and Firefox. Safari is finally adding some support to WebGL2, but it's a legacy technology relative to WebGPU. So one example is this project I've been working on called TensorBoard Plugin 3D. And this will give you a interactive 3D visualization. If you have 3D data sets that you're training um, and looking at some of the outputs in a machine learning library like PyTorch or TensorFlow. So Rebecca was asking, uh, Or when I try the IPy Canvas, I get a module not found for IPy Canvas. Um, yes, you should pip install IPy Canvas. Are you working on Google Colab, Rebecca? You may, may also run into limitations with Google Colab. And why is that? So with these visualization technologies, that's a good question here. And that is because Colab has a different communication program protocol way it communicates than Jupyter. And so that can cause some incompatibility issues. So for re reliability here, HTML, again, will be the most reliable. And uh, Canvas will, will work if it's HTML, but here we're doing the communication from the kernel to the the server of the HTML content, and we may run into issues on Colab. And sounds like Rebecca might be running into that issue there. You have to make sure you run this workaround cell um, there. For the sake of time, I'm going to kind of skip over server client side versus client side rendering details, but at a high level, it's worth noting that you have two basic options. One is server-side rendering, where on the server you do the rendering, you generate a, a frame buffer, basically a 2D image. It can come down to a PNG, so something that could be rendered as a PNG. You send that, that frame, that 2D image, that rendered image, even if it's a 3D data set, over the network, and you keep sending these 2D rendered frames over to the client, and they just display those frames. The other option is client-side rendering where the rasterization actually occurs on the client. And there are a number of tools that are available. I put some links to some of these tools that are available here. And let's uh, finish with some exercises. So give a few in, uh, minutes and depending on what environment you're running on. Again, Colab may have different results here. You may have different options, but matplotlib, the Python plotting library, has many different way rendering backends, they call them. M most of them are for working on a desktop environment, but some work in the Jupyter Notebook. And they're di using different underlying visualization technologies for the browser. So let me take a few minutes and you can run this cell and try some of the different rendering backends. We have inline IPy MPL, widget, NDAG, notebook, and see if we can understand what are the technologies that are being used by Matt Potler for these different backends. Every time you change, so you're gonna change this word here to the different backend that you wanna use. And every time you change it, you need to restart the Jupyter kernel because Jupyter uses that backend for, for the whole kernel session. So let's try that and run this cell. And you should get something like this.
Okay, so hopefully you had a chance to try a few of the backends. So how do we figure out what technology is being used in these different backends? We're going to go back to our debugger that we discovered in our last tutorial, Control Shift I, usually, or Menu to More Tools, Developer Tools, and Inside the debugger, there's many powerful, very powerful tools, including interactive debuggers. The tool that we're gonna use here is in the upper left, and this is an element inspector. So you click on this little arrow, and then you go to the page and you can click on an element and you can see uh, what type of element it is. And this is an IMG. So this is your, your IMG element that's being rendered, so a static, IMG element. If we go to change the backend to maybe IPI MPL, and then I'll restart the kernel. Okay, we have a different rendering this time. Looks like this one is interactive. If we click on the browser and select the element. This time it's a canvas. So the canvas is the interactive element that we get with IPI MPL. Okay, any questions or comments? People can please speak up or make a note in the chat. We'll move on to the next session. The next session. So the next session is an introduction to WebAssembly, which is a very exciting technology that allows you to run performant code in your browser and beyond. And the goal of this tutorial session is to first understand what are these WebAssembly binaries and how they're similar and different to your native binaries that you're using when you're executing programs on your system. Next, identify the basic WebAssembly data types and understand how a runtime interface can talk to a WebAssembly module. Third, we wanna understand the difference between the mscripten and the WASI tool chains and runtimes. And finally, become familiar with some of the basics of building, running, and debugging WebAssembly. So for this session, we're, we're going to do something a little different. We're gonna run through the tutorials in ITK WASM, and there are a few links here. First, the Hello World tutorial. So. You go to this page, this will bring you to the Hello World tutorial. I'm going to um, try to code my way through this tutorial. There are a few steps to use ITK WASM to get set up. You need to have Node.js installed on your system and also Docker, but, and, and Bash. Those are the three dependencies. But if you get that set up, then, I'm sorry, we will go into a shell. And let's create a basic problem, uh, basic project, a hello world project. We're going to generate some web assembly from C. So take the code, we'll start a new folder. And inside that folder, let's put some C code that will print out hello WASM. WASM is the, the short term for web assembly. And put that into C++. Basic program that has a main method. The main is what gets executed on the, on the command line. And then we'll set up a basic CMake build configuration file. This looks similar to, it's the, the exactly the same C++ code and 
build configuration code that you would use if you're developing a native binary. So I'll put those into the two files here. We have the cmake lists and hello.cxx. Then we're going to install ITK WASM, and this is a, a command line interface to uh, a command line program, but it's distributed with Node.js since Node and NPM are the tools of the web, the languages of the web, package manager of the web. So there's this package and then it has this command line executable, ITK WASM and get its help. So first we're going to build to WASI, the WebAssembly system interface. So we're gonna call the, the executable and the executable will build with the WASI tool chain, which is different from the mscript and tool chain and build a WASI binary. That's what we're expecting to see. So this is the command where you pass in uh, the Docker image that has the tool chain. So this has the WASI build and tool chain and build environment. Uh, the default is the mscript and tool chain and build environment. And then we have different options for the source and build directory. And then the commands we have available are to build the project into WebAssembly. You can run tests if you use CMake and CTest. You can actually run tests, so run the WebAssembly with arguments where you can run a WebAssembly binary with WebAssembly runtimes that are also contained in that Docker image. So we're going to do that. And Live coding is not, is not working for us, but the, the end result that you will get is a WASM executable. And let's go to the examples. So there are some examples, hello world here that has the content. I may maybe made a mistake in the in the the content that I was printing out there, but we can um, build with these commands here. If you're not familiar with npm, npm is the package manager, but it's also a tool to run to coordinate um, building projects and running their tests. So there are scripts that you develop with npm in the package.json file that are configured that in that way on how to build, test, and uh, start servers. If you're starting a server, you can see those scripts available. This has two scripts for this example called um, build wasi, which runs this command. And it is building and linking out the executable hello.wasi.wasm. And that is in this directory, WASI build. This is our WebAssembly file. We can see the type of that file with the Unix file command. So let's see what is that file. And the file command, which detects different files and 
describes them, says this is a WebAssembly binary module version 0x1 MVP. MVP is the WebAssembly minimal viable pro uh, product. So the version of the standard where they had something working that everyone can use and everyone uh, supports. So it's a WebAssembly file as the output. And this is a binary file that it's not a script. And this is the, the file that will be pushed to your client or your server and will be executed there and interpreted by a WebAssembly interpreter and runtime, which includes your web browser. To get a better understanding of what is actually in that WebAssembly binary module, we can use one of the many WebAssembly runtimes. So your browser is a WebAssembly runtime. There are a number of other WebAssembly runtimes that run WASI, which is local or within a web, within a language. Um, it can run on FPGAs, all different types of hardware, all different types of run, run times here. The standard one that's developed by the community is called uh, WASM time. And another popular and very powerful one is called WASMer. And so these are two command line tools that you can install. They work across architectures and operating systems. I have this installed here. Wasimer has a command called inspect that allows you to inspect a WebAssembly module. So we do Wasimer x inspect this WASI build, hello. Um, and that, describes for us what's in this WebAssembly module. And WebAssembly is very kind of simple and standardized so that it can be executed in as many places as possible. And this shows us what the basic components of this WebAssembly module is. So we see a few things. We see imports, and then we see these things that look like functions. And there's there's functions, and then we also see exports, and we see functions there too. For the imports, we see there are these WASI functions that are built when we use the WASI tool chain, and they have things like FD read and FD seek and FD, FD write. So those are functions that allow you, if you're running WebAssembly, on outside the browser, on an operating system to read, read local files, write to files. These are kind of the names. And then after that, you see a, what looks like to be a signature. And this describes the arguments to the functions and the return values to the functions. So it can return multiple values. So that's why it's, it looks like there is an array of multiple values and you can have multiple inputs. We look here, we see a few, just a few different values. They are I32, I64, I32 again, lots of I32s. So quite interesting uh, property of WebAssembly in the standard is that there's only a few basic types that are supported. And the number types that are supported are 32-bit integers, 64-bit integers, I32, I64, and 32-bit floats and 64-bit floats. And those are the basic types that are supported. That's what you have to use for your interfaces to your functions are just these, these basic types. Another basic type that's supported is uh, vector types. If you're doing, it, there is optional support in many runtimes for SIMD. So um, symmetric or, um, um, operating on, if you're doing a lot of number crunching, there, there are special um, optimized operations for running on many data points at the, at the same time, SIMD operations. There's V128. So vector 128 is another basic data type, but these 32-bit integers, 64-bit integers, and floating points, those are the basic data types. And beyond that, there's no string um, there's no uh, array, there's no dictionary that can be passed into these functions. So 
these very big basic data types. So how do you work with these kind of high level structures? Well, the other component of the module are your memories. And typically you just have one memory associated that's provided in the exports here. This is the memory. And this is a contiguous block of memory that, and that's where your data goes. And so if you want to pass some more, like a, an image data structure, then you manually work with this memory and write into this memory with different offsets and then pass in essentially pointers to that with these different functions. And so yeah, very low level in that way, but that's where functions and libraries and uh, higher level infrastructure that make things easier like ITK WASM um, are available that will do all that transformations and efficient writing into memory and taking data out of WebAssembly memory for you. Uh, it has a um, image data structure and image type data structure. So you can make false calls to functions that will internally be doing all these transformations for you. So we have these functions that are either functions you can call from the calling environment, like the JavaScript you're using, or if you're using Python or Java, you can call these functions. Those are the, um, those are the export functions. And uh, when you build with I2K WASM, it also adds to these export functions some basic foundational functions that allow you to that allows it to do that transfer of these higher level data structures. The other functions we see in, in the export functions here are main, which is the function we wrote in our C++, and that's the standard entry point for running a command line executable. And then there's also this start, and that is a function. This is where WebAssembly actually, when it starts up, it looks for this start, and start does things like initialization of memory, and eventually it calls main um, for, for the C++. And then you know there's, there's other ways of compiling to WebAssembly like Rust, um, but when a Web, WebAssembly interpreter comes in, it'll, it'll look for this start and, and, and execute that. You can also pass in these imports, which are functions that you can call from WebAssembly that are provided by the, the calling environment. So this is here providing a read function that if we, in our C++ code, we, we called read, then it would uh, provide that and, 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 and call that, that function into the different operating system to actually do the read in the file system. Cool, so that's cool. So that's WebAssembly and that's WASI. So this is what, what the WebAssembly looks like that you can run locally uh, in addition to running in the, in the browser. That's the, the WASI tool chain and environment. Let's also look at uh, MScript in now. So we're gonna build with the MScript and tool chain. And that built into a different directory. We see there's another set of .wasm files, and these are also WebAssembly files. And these are, again, WebAssembly files, but when we do inspect on them, it looks different. So here we see the functions have very succinct names and there's many different ones. So mscripten will provide many other hooks so that you can work with and execute the WebAssembly module in a JavaScript environment and hook into many different pieces of the JavaScript runtime like WebGL or the different web APIs and, and it provides many other tools. So uh, the take home message here is that mscripten is a best suited tool chain for running in the browser or Node.js, and WASI is a tool chain that 
is best suited for running on the server side or embedded in another language. So it's enough looking, let's try some things. So we have a link I provided on running some WebAssembly yourself. So open this webassembly.sh link and that will take you to a terminal in your browser that you can run commands. And why don't you try running these commands, help about and cow say I do K what? Hello, I do K wasm world. Okay, so maybe you were able to run this. This is very interesting. This is running a, a kind of operating system in your browser. And when you run a command, it actually fetches that web assembly from the net, runs the interpreter and executes it in your browser. Is this running the mscription or WASI runtime? So you may think it's running in your web browser, it's running in Scripton. It's actually running a WASI. And so it has a special WASI file system that's set up and it's running with. So mscripton comes with a virtual file system out of the box. Here you have to manually hook it up and use it, uh, but it is it can be used in this way, running in the web browser. Uh, where is the data stored? So there's a virtual file system that is running in memory. And that's where things are running in this shell that has this kind of virtual file system that you can LS and download files into. And does this shell have access to your full, your local file system? If you try to access some files, the answer is no. So something to be aware of that even with WASI, there's an attention to security and isolation. So it's like a, a very contained environment, even if you're running it on the server. And so we built this kind of hello, uh, hello world opening to the console. But if um, when you try to run with these server side runtimes, if you try to access local files, you don't, even if you're running on a server side, you don't have access to the local file system by default. All these runtimes contain an argument called uh, dir. So you have this explicitly provide access to the directories that you want the WebAssembly module to have access to. So there's st still the sandboxing and isolation that you get with um, web WebAssembly running in your browser. There's still the security. So this, if you want to access local um, files on the file system, they will fail unless you pass the directory that you're providing access to before you run the WebAssembly module. So that's WebAssembly. We're running out of time here. I have, there's a few more tutorials that you can look at on your own on working with image data for on the web in these different scalable web-friendly formats and also computing on the web with Dask and uh, distributed computing on a local cluster or remote cluster and computing in the cloud. But for the remaining time, I'm going to pass the uh, screen sharing and discussion to Pranjal. And he's going to go over kind of a summary example of what you can do with these different technologies in a, in a pipeline for analyzing a image analysis pipeline that works on data from the osteoarthritis initiative. And this is an initiative for understanding how the cartilage in your knees uh, deteriorates as you age. 
So Pranjal, can you screen share or would you like me to go through your slides here? So it's disabled that screen sharing. So you can probably, uh, yeah, describe the slides. And okay. So yeah, we don't have time to, I think, go through the notebooks. So you can probably mention about the three notebooks that we have created. Okay. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and, and uh, talk through these slides and let me know when you want to advance through them. Okay. Yeah, so uh, there are three notebooks uh, in this tutorial. Uh, which are mostly on task based processing. And this is the GitHub repo, which you can visit uh, to try out, try out those notebooks, uh, uh, OI analysis too. And this image, which you're seeing on the right, describes the pipeline. Uh, essentially what we are doing is taking knee MRI images, segmenting the knee region, and then performing some mesh processing to get the thickness of those knees, and then finally projecting it into Two D two dimension to see where the thickness, how the thickness is varying with time. So this work is done using this data set, OI data set, and as you can see, uh, it's like hundreds of terabytes, uh, and you just cannot do it locally. Uh, you need this, some sort of distributed computing to perform this analysis on all these patients. So there are three uh, notebooks in this. Uh, one is this first full demo notebook, which you should run using Colab GPU runtime, which will uh, demonstrate those all those steps which I showed before. Uh, and it will end to end. So you just need to like go through, click, uh, and it should work. Uh, just remember to restart the runtime after installing the packages. Um, so once you have done this, then the next tutorial is on showing how you can perform this computation in parallel using Dask. So this tutorial will show you only how to run it locally. So again, this will run on Collab uh, and you will be able to see uh, a graph. Uh, is, is it possible to show the, open the notebook? Uh, I can quickly, there's the link in the slide. Yeah. Sure. Yep. So if you can go down, uh, yeah, it, it will download the data, all the data which is needed to run and everything it's, so again, you just have to quick click it uh, step by step. And if you go down, uh, you will see how it creates the graph of computation graph of this pipeline. And then finally, when you run it, you can visualize the result in the browser itself. Uh, and if you run it locally, you will be able to see this uh, Dask cluster UI, which will show you how, uh, what resources are there in the cluster and how much time it took for each step. And finally, there is the last notebook, which is on performing this same computation on a coil cluster. Uh, so that is, uh, can you uh, move to the slides? Yeah. Which, uh, so this, which I, the two notebooks, which I showed was on Google Colab. And let's say now we want to perform this analysis on, on the entire data set, you will need more resources. And that's where the coil comes. It gives you an in easy interface to connect with an AWS account where you can spawn as many workers you want uh, with given specification of RAM, et cetera. And for this, you can open this notebook. Uh, for this, uh, you will have to sign up for Coil. And once you get an activation link, uh, it should be easy to follow the steps. You will need to create an API token here. And once you have that, the Docker environment is already set up. So again, you have to go through step-by-step step in this tutorial and you can see that uh, this computation gets performed in an AWS cluster. Uh, so, and if you face any issues, yeah, yeah, feel free to uh, create an issue in the GitHub. So we'll be happy to look into that. Okay, thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, we're out of time, but thank you everyone for attending and participating.